PowerPoint y tu a PDF. Mm, no me lo he traído. Si quieres presentarme, y voy diciendo cosas que voy a decir luego que no necesitan una imagen ¿Sí? para que no se nos aburran. Voy diciendo. Despite these technical problems, uh, our speaker today is, uh, is ready to start uh, telling us some things. So I think we will start uh, waiting for the PDF to come. <laughs> uh, so I just want to briefly introduce uh, our speaker today. I don't want to take much time from, from her. That is the one that has really has uh, fantastic things to explain to us. So, uh, she's Matilde Cañelles López, is a research scientist at CSIC. She was first at the Institute of Parasitology and Biomedicine in Granada, at the Institute of López Neira, and in there she was working in immunology for uh, uh, over 20 years. In 2019, she uh, made a stage of two years in the Institute of Philosophy in CSIC, uh, changing topics uh, even with that background in, in biology and immunology for which she did a very great contributions but she moved more to dissemination and communication activities uh, especially relevant afterwards during the pandemics right uh, she's very active in communication activities uh, of science at the institute of or from the institute of philosophy she worked close closely with communication media to get science to society. Uh, that is also one of our duties as scientists. Um, she's uh, responsible of uh, the blog uh, Thinking Science uh, from Substack, in case you want to check online. Very interesting contributions there. And she has been the author of the book Vaccines from the series that Physic has on what we know about. Also very interesting uh, contribution. Uh, she feels close to uh, Catalin Caricó. She will explain us why uh, during the presentation. Uh, she did, uh, Matilde uh, did her bachelor and master in the University of, of Moscow. Uh, and, and that's, uh, as we will learn later on, uh, close to uh, our great scientist today, Catalin Caricó. The title of the presentation is The Power of Focus. Uh, she is an Hungarian-American biochemist. Um, I don't want to spoil the talk, just to uh, say that she is a great scientist that uh, encountered many difficulties at the beginning. Uh, and and that's, uh, that will be an inspiration for all of us. So I just uh, give the, the word to Matilde. Thank you very much for being here today. And of course, to all of you for attending. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and I have enjoyed very much preparing this talk because uh, Katarin Carico is really an amazing woman and we can learn a lot about her from her story, um, from her interactions with, with science. We can have a, a few lessons. Uh, since I am at the Institute of Philosophy, one of the things that I have learned at this institute is that not always, you don't always need a PowerPoint to give a talk. 
<laughs> they are able to be speaking for a whole hour without any slides, and you will follow them <laughs> and be with your op with your eyes very open. So I will try while I have the the real presentation, and maybe because most of the of the images I want to show are pictures. Uh, once we have the presentation, I can go over the pictures, but this way I can start to introduce you uh, to the life of Catalin Carico, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, the first thing I wanted to make is a, a personal professional timeline so that uh, you have the whole picture before I start uh, to focus on the areas that for me, were mo most interesting, but I'm, I'm sure I'm living many things, <laughs> so, so you can ask later. She was born in 1955, which is post-World uh, War II in Hungary, but Hungary, it's not she was born in the, in the um, main city. She was born in a village, and she uh, was the daughter of a butcher, and she grew up in a house which didn't have uh, running water, so that we can have an idea of, of, um, of the, um, the, the beginnings of her life. Uh, she, from the same beginning, she liked very much biology, and she focused on that, and she received the third, third place in a national biology competition when she was at, uh, at high school, and that was the, the, um, the start of her... Uh, when I talk about focus, you will see what is focus. Then, in, in, then she did her bachelor and master degree in Segel University in Hungary, which is a, a very good university. Uh, and then she stayed. Ah. So now we can, we can watch the picture of her family, yes. which I think it's important for our story. I will continue, and then we can watch at the pictures. Uh, so she stayed in Hungary for the PhD, and even for the first postdoc yeah, at a very prestigious institute, which is called the Biochemistry uh, Institute of, of Biochemistry, which was pretty, pretty good. And really, in, as I will tell you later, in the in the Soviet Union and in the the countries which were um, uh, under uh, Soviet uh, um, power. Uh, Science was very centralized, and when I tell you that an institute was good, it was really good. You, you have to... <laughs> I have been to one of those. So that's where she did her PhD, and then uh, uh, started her, his, her postdoc, but this is already mid-80s, so uh, pro there were problems, financing problems. Ah, oh, here we are. This is Catalin Carico. <laughs> Uh, this way, right? Yeah. Ah, oh, great. Here is her family. This is the pointer. This is her family. As I was explaining, this is the. The center is the pointer. Genial, sí, genial. Y para pasar es aquí, ¿no? Aquí. Ah, perfecto. Entonces, es este. Ah, perfecto. Ok, here we see. Her, her, this is her family. This is, this is Catalin. When she was a little girl, you can see uh, determination in her face. At least I, I see. I see it. 
Uh, so we were at the postdoctoral uh, when she was at her postdoc. Uh, her daughter was born, and uh, with the upcoming um, fall of the Soviet Union, she migrates to the U.S. Uh, this was not easy. Uh, they have uh, it was not easy for them. You can imagine. Uh, she gets a, fa a position, then she works there until 1988, then she gets a five-year position at Pennsylvania University, which is, I believe, uh, working on, on her uh, lifetime uh, line of work, which she never abandoned. But she was struggling with funding. She never got a grant during these five years. And it's not like she didn't apply for grants. She was applying for a grant every month for a new grant, and she never got funding. So there was a moment after five years when, when the, um, they tell her, well, you cannot stay here anymore because it's only five years, your position, go somewhere else. And she says, can I stay? What happens if I stay? Nobody at, at University of Pennsylvania had stayed um, if they didn't get uh, promoted. There was only promotion, but she got demoted. They changed her position and she stayed there. And, uh, but uh, still, she didn't get funding. Uh, 2012, she gets evicted from her lab. And one day, she comes to the lab and all her things are in the corridor. And so that's when she gets a position at BioNTech. And in 2023, she gets the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. So you can imagine that the story is quite <laughs> unusual. This is her uh, at her lab, the one she was evicted from. And um, it's interesting that when, when she was talking to the chair uh, the, of the department, uh, when, when she found out that she had been evicted because they didn't even tell her in advance, she told him, but do you know that this lab is going to be a museum? <laughs> At that moment, she knew. <laughs> she knew. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm going to, to focus on just five aspects, and I'm going to go over them pretty quickly, but if you are interested in, in one of them, then later we can, we can focus on, on them. So the first one is uh, how was science, what was different in, in science in the Soviet Union and in the countries under the Soviet Union, the Eastern European countries. Uh, well, a little bit of history. Uh, the ideology of the Soviet Union was Marxist-Leninism, and science was a crucial component of this uh, philosophy. It was very important, science. When Stalin's, uh, Stalin uh, gains power, he was more pragmatic. Uh, what he did is work on the construction of a Soviet scientific system very uh, with a big hierarchy in this system. Um, there were good things and there were bad things. The bad things we know, uh, especially biologists, we know that uh, science was subordinated to politics. So if any discipline or any area uh, they, they thought they did not agree with their philosophy, it was blocked. As it was, genetics was blocked for a long, long time. While in the US, they were working with genes, they were ignoring genes. They don't exist. We are creating the new man, and there are no genes there. But they were, there were good things about, about uh, science in the Soviet Union during the Stalinist uh, pe period. Uh, they reorganize uh, science, uh, they make big structures the same way that, that Stalin loved big buildings. This is the Lomonosov University building. I used to study at this university and I used to live at this building somewhere here. Uh, it's a, the, 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 this big building represents how they constructed science. It was very, a very big chunk of the budget 
of, of, of the country was given to science. There were many, many institutes that work in any, anything you can imagine. There was an institute working on that. Uh, they were very, uh, there was a, a separation between science and politics. There was the scientist was only working on science. You didn't need to think about budget, about money, even about publication. There were many results that, that were never published. They just did science. They thought about science, they had an idea, they did, they did the experiments, and once the, the problem was solved, they were happy. Um, they were prestigious. A scientist had a lot of prestige in the, in the Soviet Union. Uh, and there, there were a lot of bureaucrats who, were, who took care of politics, organization, funding, and all the rest. So there was a big separation. There were two parallel systems. What happened in Eastern European countries, they were under the same umbrella, so the system was pretty similar. Uh, education was very important, and uh, this, this education was focused on talent, and they were all the time, they were extracting those children who showed talent maybe for sports or for science, and they trained them since school. The, uh, in fact, I remember when I studied at the Lomonosov University, uh, one day a week, when we went out from our classes, there were a lot of uh, small children that entered the, fa the, the faculty of biology, and they, they, these were children which had sh shown that they were good at biology, and they, they were already training them. So it was a system that, that took all the people, and every person went into what this person was good. Um, and in Hungary, it was even more. There, there are, there are m m many papers talking about how, what happened with Hungarians, be because they have, they have a lot of Nobel Prizes. Karikon is not the first. Uh, they had a focus on math. They had the very prestigious uh, competitions for school children in math. And they were the same thing they did in, in the Soviet Union. And in fact, the, this prize that got Kariko when she was at high school, it was one of these. And these uh, children then, they would go to the best universities and to the best institutes to do investigation. Um, and in Hungary, the specificity, specificity is the, the, in the Stalinist period, the, the person who was in charge was very Stalinist because there was some variation between Eastern European countries. Here, he was very Stalinist, so it was mirroring what happened in the Soviet Union. Okay, we know uh, what education she got, which I think is important. It will be important when we talk about her story. Now we are going to, to go to, to a part of her life that interests me especially because uh, when I went into humanities, my main fo focus was what was the, the role of the women in science and what are the difficulties uh, we as women have and how can we manage with those. So I'm going to just show one slide about her family life. Uh, to see if we can learn something. <laughs> she, wa she married to a man wh who, this is a picture of her, her wedding day, married to a man that, who was much younger, younger than her, who had no higher education. Her mother uh, always said, this is not going to work, Cathy, this is not going to work. But we, we, we know <laughs> that that was even, even it made her more eager to say, okay, it will work. <laughs> uh, the, her daughter was two years old when they migrated to the US. This is a picture of the daughter when they migrated. What they did is sell the car, and the money that they got from selling the car, they put into this teddy bear, and that's all they had when they migrated to the US, the money in the teddy bear of, her, of their little uh, daughter. Uh, what tells uh, Katalin Kariko in her memoir is that uh, she missed the Hungarian daycare. She says when she was at her postdoc, the daycare was amazing, and when she gets to the US, mm, not so good. So uh, her husband helped her a lot, raising the daughter, which I think, hmm, <laughs> that's a good idea, that's pragmatic at least. 
Um, she was very perfectionist and she tells in her memoir one day when her daughter had to do a task for school, which was a, and we can imagine already what kind of person is Catalin Careco. Her daughter had to do a task uh, for school, which was a travel log. She, she had to make a, an imaginary travel, like she went to many places, put, put in pictures. Uh, and, and saying what she saw in those places. So Catalin goes to a travel agency and gets many do of those pamphlets and goes to, to goes home and says, okay, let's go work on this, on this travel log. And they start working and they start working and this and that and the other and they spend the whole la night making the, they didn't sleep making the, this travel log, which I imagine the, the teachers must have been amazed when, when the girl gets, gets to, to school with this amazing work. So this is the kind of person she, she, she is very perfectionist. Whatever she does, she does well. Uh, then when the daughter was a, a teen, she had disagreements because the, the daughter didn't want, she said she didn't want to go to a good university and she pushed her, pushed her. And I imagine <laughs> if Catalin Carico is your mother and, and, you, and she sets her mind into you, going to, a, to an Ivy League university, you better go there. <laughs> so she gets, the, the daughter gets accepted at the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania uh, while she is uh, studying. She goes to the Olympic uh, on rowing and she gets uh, the gold medal twice. That means once she got into the Olympic team, she went to the Olympics and she won the gold medal. And after four years, she gets into the Olympic team, she goes to the, to the Olympics and she wins the, the gold medal. So. I wonder if this is genes or just having such a mother. <laughs> it's like, I have to do something. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting that, that Catalin, she, she talks about the rowing example. What she says is, when you are rowing, you are looking uh, backwards. You are rowing, you are not seeing where you are going. What you do is just row as, as best as you can. And, and then finally you get into the into the you, you get the, the gold medal, which is she says it's kind of a, an image of how she got her her uh, Nobel Prize. It's like it's not she wanted to get the Nobel Prize. She just work and work and work and work and finally things work uh, and, and you get the the gold medal or you get the Nobel Prize. Okay, I'm going to to talk briefly about uh, what was the breakthrough that she made in science, uh, focusing on... So I, I started uh, very critically saying, okay, did she uh, deserve the Nobel Prize or she didn't? Because I know some people get the Nobel Prize, but they don't dis really deserve it. Uh, let's see. <laughs> did, does she? So uh, first, uh, I... Uh, we know that she's a very determined woman. She worked all her life on RNA. That's it. All, all her life. She ended university, started working on RNA, and now she works on RNA all her life. Uh, why RNA? A little bit of history of, of how, what was going on. Well, in 1953 is when the structure of DNA is described. In 1972, uh, the first time recombinant DNA is constructed. In 1977, the first time DNA is sequenced. In 1982 is when Carico starts her PhD. So I can imagine, knowing what we know about, about her, DNA was all the rage at that moment. And she says, hmm. It's, going not, not, it's not going to be DNA, it's going to be RNA. And she decided to work on RNA, and that's what she will do her whole life. It's like a contrari contrarian, they call them in the US. So she, it's like she never did what everyone else did. She always a different twist. Okay, what is messenger 
RNA, which is, uh, uh, there are several types of, of RNAs you work on messenger RNA. Uh, messenger RNA is a carrier of information. The information of all the proteins that, uh, that a cell contains are in the DNA. The DNA is inside the nucleus of the cell. And so, the, in order to, co to, co to construct the proteins uh, we need this information outside of the nucleus. Uh, it's like, like if DNA is the cookbook and then we get a photocopy of one of the recipes, which is, this is mRNA, the photocopy of the recipe. And then the mRNA goes into the, into the cytoplasm of the cell and gets uh, uh, transcripted into proteins. It's, it just carries the information from, from nucleus to the cytoplasm. And what was the logic of Carico when she chose to, to, to devote herself to mRNA? She thought that mRNA had a better uh, therapeutic potential because uh, in her mind, uh, DNA has to go to the nucleus, DNA has to integrate into, into the rest of the DNA, but mRNA is just one molecule. You can insert it in the cytoplasm and you can have the proteins. It was sound thinking. I think it was logical. But there were a few bottlenecks. And there, there were a few reasons why everyone else wanted to work on DNA, and she was the only who, who worked on RNA. The first one was that it, it is a very unstable molecule that needs a extremely clean lab and special manipulation. Well, that, not, that was not a problem for her, so I won't talk about that anymore. But normally in a lab, there is an RNA uh, area where everything is very clean because otherwise the RNA will, it will degrade. So you need the special manipulation. That was the first bottleneck. The second bottleneck, no one had synthesized RNA in the lab when she started her studies. The third bottleneck is the, uh, even inside the cell, mRNA is very unstable, gets degraded very easily. The, uh, fourth bottleneck, it's very immunogenic, activates the immune system and generates inflammation. So this is what she was facing when she started to try to convert mRNA into a therapeutic agent. Now, here I'm showing the timeline of how the mRNA vaccines were uh, developed in time and how the three bottlenecks, uh, the three main bottlenecks were solved. Not all were solved directly by her, but she solved them in her lab independently. The, so, uh, in 1960 is when uh, messenger RNA is discovered, so pretty late. 1978, uh, scientists use fatty membranes, stroke structures, liposomes to transport substances into mouse and human cells. 1984, Crick and Maniatis generate synthetic mRNA in the lab, which is before, which is after Catalin Carico started working on mRNA. 1987, Robert Malone creates liposomes that, con that contain mRNA, and he is able to express these proteins from the mRNA on, in those cells. And later, Robert Malone would claim that he was the inventor of the mRNA vaccine, which is not true, obviously. Uh, 1987, 97 other scientists tried to use the mRNA in the lab, but they uh, didn't uh, continue because it was unstable, it was very expensive. And in 1997, Catalin Carico, when she was already, she, she had been already demoted. Uh, uh, she meets with Drew Wiesman, who was an immunologist, and uh, she explains that she wants to use mRNA therapeutically and all that. And at that time, Drew Wiesman was working on an uh, AIDS vaccine. Uh, he says, okay, 
why don't try? Let's try with the mRNA. Uh, and so here they find the problem that it's highly monogenic. So they make the mRNA, they, have, they can introduce it into the cells uh, in, in a way that it's not degraded, but once that happens, what happens is that the, the organism has a, a very, very big uh, immun, in, inflammation and all that. So it was like, mm, we don't want to do that. As a, it's not going to work. It was really difficult. Uh, then in two, 2000, uh, start the first steps in, in the industry to use mRNA against cancer. And the company Curevac was founded, which is the first company that tried to use mRNA therapeutically. Uh, and in two, 2005 is when the breakthrough comes out. Carico and Weisman solve the immunogenicity problem, which is uridine modification. They modify one of the, of the bases of the RNA so that the, it uh, doesn't produce this immunogenic uh, reaction in the cell. And they file a patent on this. Uh, then in 2008 and 2010, BioNTech and Moderna were founded, by the way, Moderna, if I learned this recently, it comes from modified RNA, the word Moderna, which I didn't know before. Uh, in 2020, BioNTech and Moderna developed the mRNA vaccines, and we know the, the rest of the story. So this was the breakthrough, and it was really, it really deserves a Nobel Prize. It was not easy at all if, and if it was not because Carico met uh, Weisman and Weisman believed in her, uh, we wouldn't have had those early vaccines. You can imagine how many deaths that would have been. So, uh, as, as I was explaining, the problem here is that in the, in the body we have uh, a special kind of cells of the immune system, which are called dendritic cells, and they are like the police of the body. And they alert the body that there is, there is an intruder and uh, start signaling, and those signals are in the form of inflammation. Uh, so when they were very happy because finally they, they were able to synthesize the mRNA, to make it stable inside the cell, but uh, they got a very big inflammation problem in those, on, in those mice when they tried it. But uh, they observed that certain types of DNA didn't produce inflammation. There, as I told before, there are several types of RNA, so certain types didn't, didn't uh, produce inflammation. And here, Catalin Carico goes back in time and reads old papers, and she, she uh, some, somehow realizes that there is a uridine modification that can be modified, and maybe that was the common thing that had those mRNAs that didn't produce inflammation. And she says, okay, why don't we try to modify uridine and, and express it in the cells, and that's what they did, and what do they find they express this mRNA with the uridine modification? And not only they didn't have the inflammation, but uh, there, were more, there was more protein produced. So they, they, they get no inflammation and a boost in production, product, production of protein. And this was the Eureka moment, and they were so happy, and they were, they were uh, sure that this this meant uh, fame and glory, and all the journalists will be, will be making cue to talk to us and all that, but not. <laughs> we, we keep going on. <laughs> so this is how Caricot tells in her memoir 
this moment, she says, 30 years I've been doing the, this work a day at a time, an experiment at a time, a laugh at a time. And finally, finally, it was all here. We had a way to make mRNA in the lab. We could deliver that mRNA into cells. We could protect our mRNA from degradation by incorporating pseudouridine into the mRNA. We could keep it from causing an inflammatory reaction. And it also translated into a great deal of proteins. Of course, they write the paper, they sent it to nature, it gets rejected. They sent it to science, it gets rejected. And the answer was, this is incre an incremental contribution. So finally, they sent it to immunity, which is a very respectable journal in immunology. It's very difficult to, to publish uh, at immunity. And they get the paper accepting no reaction, no journalist. It, it gets unnoticed. No, nobody notices this, this paper. Um, but of course, uh, finally, they got their patent and, and all companies got interested into it. So here I wanted to analyze what helped her in, in following all this process and, and not uh, falling in, into the pro uh, way into the process. The first focus, she worked non-stop on mRNA since her PhD. Eastern education, as I have told, with, with the focus on science and not of flashy popul uh, publications or funding money. Uh, she was very meticulous. She repeated the experiments as many times as, as needed. She was an avid reader. She knew what others had done and would need. She read every, everything uh, from her field and from other areas. Uh, she was resilient. She was the first person at, at University of Pennsylvania to not get promotion after five years and yet stay. And, and she, with her first husband, they used to make fun of it. They uh, say, her first husband say, Katy, this is remarkable. <laughs> you have done, they had to create a position for you. This is something, you have done something remarkable. Uh, she was, she is very practical. She went when, wherever she could pursue her long-time dream, apply mRNA as a, as a therapy. And what were the main obstacles? First, funding. She did, didn't get any grants, as I have explained. Uh, what they used to say, it's not what you do, is not relevant, it has no potential. Uh, hierarchy. She was a nobody. She says that many times. I, I was a nobody. Uh, because she didn't have grants, so she was not, she was an, a nobody. Uh, she didn't get promotion, she got demoted. So I think this, is, this might be a footprint of the Eastern European formation of that focusing just, just on my science and not on everything else. But if you go to the States, the, the mentality is different. Uh, in general, in, in Occident, as we Tell, mm, I, there are other things that are important. You have grant money, you don't have grant money, you went to, to this un university. So the, she, she was still, she had like, like this was, uh, mm, we can perceive it as a burden, but I don't think it's a burden because, uh, because of that education, she followed the science and not everything else. So uh, it didn't help her, but it was good. Okay, what lessons we get as scientists? First, focus. Focus, focus, focus. Even if there are difficulties, you follow, follow, follow. Be aware of publications, all that new, read. We, we must know the history of our discipline. We must know what has been done before so that we don't repeat the, the we don't repeat the mistakes and, and uh, many times we can go back and get things that we can use from, from the past. Uh, go or, or stay where you can develop your skills and she is very, very humble and she shows gratitude even to people who have demoted her or have, uh, the, in fact, in one of the acceptance uh, is, uh, when she's uh, received Prices, she says specifically, thank you for using pen, using pen for demoting me because that gave me the, the energy to make my discovery. <laughs> so she converts everything into positive. Uh, and finally, lessons for science. This is a hard lesson for science. Uh, this is also from her, from her uh, memoir. This is when she was in academy. 
just before getting evicted from her lab and she describes the, the last uh, meeting that she had with the chair of the department and she says the fact was I barely cost this department anything. I didn't get paid much. My salary was laggable compared with those of the neurosurgeon uh, of the neurosurgeons who surrounded me. I was now in my 50s and I still did all my experiments by myself. I had no staff, no postdocs. All these years, I, uh, even ever since my demotion, I've been attending faculty meetings when I wasn't even a faculty member. And in, in front of me now, this, this man, Sean, was still talking, not about science, not about all the ways mRNA might help the world, but rather, as always, about budgets and about, about funding. This is what, what she remembers from academy. This is what she tells when she went to industry. There was a, such a a uh, practicality to industry. The science worked or it didn't. If, if the science was good, if the data supported one approach over the other, that's what mattered. It didn't matter whether you spoke with an accent or whether you attended an Ivy League school or if you were good at smoothing. So this is what she sees, the, the contrast, when she was in, in academy, when she goes into industry. And, and there is this other lesson, which is related, that was very well stated by Stuart Buck in, in Stack Journal. And she, he, he says this at the end of the article, and I think this is very important. That's why we should worry about the invisible caricos, the people with good ideas that weren't popular at the time who dropped out of academia. It's unlikely that she was the only person in the world who had an interesting idea in 1985 that could have turned into a groundbreaking discovery over the next few decades. We'll never know what we missed. So that's the problem that we face now in, in, in academy. We, have, we, ha, we are working here, but there is another world, which is the industry, and the industry is continually getting people from academy unless we change. Uh, reading. Uh, well, there is this, I, I have based this talk in, in a lot of reading. Uh, one very interesting is Stalinist science by Nikolai Kremenchov, where he describes all these big science from the from the the Soviet Union, which I didn't get to tell you. But then, after the Sputnik, the United States copied the big science model from the Soviet Union, and they start doing that in the in in the states, and that's why they start funding with NIH, NIH. In, in, in fact, it's, it, it's like a copy of the big science of the Soviet Union. Uh, then Science and Philosophy in the Soviet Union by Lauren Graham, where she explains all this connection between ideology and science. Then the memoir by Catalin Carico is remarkable, very easy to read, similar to a science paper, very accurate account, she no self-marketing, no self-indulgent, no agenda, she doesn't want to revenge, she doesn't want money, she doesn't want fame and glory. I think what she wants is, is uh, journalists to start, uh, stop uh, talking to her and just, uh, she says, read my memoir, <laughs> it's all there. It's a very accurate account of everything that happened to her. And then the other papers, the Hungarian phenomenon, the, so about RNA, about uh, vaccines, and that's all. Thanks. I wanted to thank especially those people who helped me to jump from doing science to into thinking science. Uh, Teresa Ortiz from the University of Granada, who is already retired, but she helped me a whole lot. Uh, Patricia Fara from Cambridge University. Uh, who is specializing in women in science, and Concha Roldán Eularia Pérez Sedeño from the Institute of Philosophy, and in general, all people at the Institute of Philosophy who have accepted me and, and thought that I had potential in this area of knowledge. And that's all. Thank you very much.
very, very scary because we got the machine just by chance. Like how many people like Carico are just pushed out from academia? And, and the thing, and the question, my question is, are we doing anything to solve it or is just something that it, it cannot be sorted out? Well, I think we are doing is it's uh, I think uh, sci I'm optimistic. I think the scientific system is changing uh, if only because of these kind of cases, these kind of cases and, and the openness of Catalin Carico in, in telling uh, all the story without any that uh, that fact uh, makes uh, science change. But there is a still a long way. And sometimes I'm a bit pessimistic because I think we are going a bit slowly, especially in those areas where industry is very, very um, advanced, like physics. I, I know about so many physicists who are going, mathematics, who are going into, into industry, biology. It's amazing. When I was in the States, I was doing my postdoc. And uh, there were many PhD students, many postdocs. I will say that 80% of them, they wanted straight to go to industry. That was postdocs. Now it's PhDs. They are doing the PhD. They know when they start the PhD that they are going into industry. So I think this is something we should be thinking about right now. How can we make uh, these people uh, feel um, good in science, and I think we could learn a lot about about the Soviet system. I know that Soviet. We can say maybe that the Soviet Union was not perfect, but it was a an, an very good system of making scientists feel good in in while doing science. So I think as a society we need to think about that. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I'm just curious about the person itself. If you are rejected uh, 60 times after five years, like proposal after proposal, uh, what makes you uh, move forward? So what kind of personality or was she a work alcoholic or was she, you know, like, Despite of that, she was still going to the lab, and but she had a character that made her, you know, keep on going. So, what triggered that? So, more from an emotional point of view. That's a very good question. I, I have thought about that a lot while reading her memoir, and I sometimes I think she was like Don Quixote. <laughs> it's just that that it got well for her. <laughs> it worked for her. Uh, but sometimes not. Sometimes I think, okay, you are. She was focusing on science. Why the fact that if if you have a lab where you have where you can work and pursue your your um, final goal, which is to make mRNA uh, a therapy with mRNA, why do you need to get all those grants and all those signs of 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 prestige. So I think the she was wise. And all the rest of us uh, let ourselves uh, go into the rat race too easily. She was saying, I don't need all those grants. I'm just, I have enough money to, to run these experiments. And I know that I, I'm going in the right direction. So it's, it's kind of. Uh, to the, the, the most important trait that she had is, is she has this uh, ability to isolate herself from what all the rest is doing. When everyone was working on DNA, she wanted to work on RNA. When everyone wanted to have five, six grants, a lot of, a lot of money, a lot of students, a lot of, but she says, if you have all that, then you, have, you don't have time to do the science. And she was right. So I think, uh, the, the most important thing is to be able to think by yourself and not what everyone, everyone else is doing. Uh, 
Uh, thank you for the talk. It was so inspiring. I have a two questions, actually. Uh, one is related with this. I mean, how you can still think about like your work, it's worth for it. I mean, five years, you don't get any grant. I would say like, maybe I'm in a wrong way and I will change my way, actually. I mean, if I couldn't get anything and five years, it's a quite long time. And I would say, okay, maybe I'm in a wrong way and I will change my way. How you can keep that and believe in your thought, your science, your way? And the second is, do you think she couldn't get any grant or supportive things just because she was a, she's a woman? Okay, let's go with the first. Okay. The first is very related to wh what I was talking about before, and I think it's very important. I think it's a question on, uh, of unframing. When I say unframing, I say if if you can work in a lab and do experiments, which is what you, what you want. Why do you care that you are not getting... Uh, she, she always had enough money to work because she had collaboration. She always had uh, people who believe in her along the way and who help her to get enough money to work in the lab. And, and so you can uh, think as everyone else and say, oh, if I don't get a grant, I'm, I, I'm useless, I, I have to go to some... Or you can think, well, as long as I can work, and I, have a, a, I can work in a lab, and I can do the experiments, and I'm getting results, all is fine. And when did she go to industry? When they evicted her from the lab, she didn't have a lab anymore, so she had to go to industry. Okay, so... Um, Sometimes I think it's very important to uh, unframe, to, to say, okay, I have this big problem, I cannot sleep, this is a big problem. Okay, try to unframe. Is it really a big problem? Or maybe it's just I'm following everyone else. And maybe if I think out of the box in a different way, um, I, cannot, I can see it as not as such a big problem. And then about wo women versus men, uh, I have thought a lot about women in science. And so, I think now it used to be much worse for women, I have to say, because I have studied the women in, in science since the 60s, and it used to be very hard for them because they were rejected uh, where they work. It's, uh, it's not, they, they, people didn't want women working at the labs. And that's all. And so it was very hard to do your experiments, to, to get your position. Um, but now it's a bit different. The problem is there, is there is something that we can work with. That's why I found that, that Catalin Carico was very wise. Um, when a woman, the, the problem is when a woman should be working hardest is when she is getting her tenure. When the woman is getting her tenure is when the children are small, because of the kind of ti timing we have now. So, you have your children, and I have them yet. You have your children, you, have, you want to get tenure, but <laughs> eventually uh, children are more important. And what do they offer you? They offer you more work. They say, okay, you are a woman, we are, we are going to make you chair of this or chair of that, or you are going to particip participate in this commission or the other. And when you are with the little children and you are trying to combine, it, to combine all those things, what you want is not more work, you, you want help. So, so that's the big problem. She solved it her own way. She married a man who didn't, who, who loved uh, being at home and, and taking more care of the, of the girl than, than herself. That's one way. The other way, if society wants to help in this, don't give us more work. Give us, for example, help. Give us a technician who can help us or give us 
uh, money to hire a person that can help us, but don't, don't give us more work because that we don't have time. We need help. That's how I, I see the problem for women right now and why uh, many women at that point that you say when she didn't get tenure, if she didn't have a husband who was carrying a lot of the weight of, of child uh, raising, maybe that's the point when, when she, she would have left. And we haven't solved that problem yet. Uh, yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, very nice talk, by the way. But you mentioned that uh, in in the union and in the Soviet Union, they didn't bother about publication, but science, and maybe they finished a project and you, they didn't even didn't, didn't publish it. So uh, was Carico publishing the partial results he was obtaining during these five years or not? Because maybe she 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 was following this this approach, and was what uh, penalizing her. I mean. That's, that's, I don't know if she was publishing partial results that she was having with mRNA, uh, or maybe not. And that's why she didn't get any, any grant or any funding. Well, that's a very good question. She was publishing, but as we saw with the example of her breakthrough, she was always publishing below the level of, the, of her results. Why? Because she don't have grants, she was not. She don't have a big uh, network of people. She don't go to the Ivy League university and had the right contacts. She had an accent when she went to the meetings. She had an accent, and that cost you in the U.S. I know myself about that. So in the U.S., when you're doing science in the U.S., uh, you are doing half science, half marketing. You have to, to go to the meetings, you have to speak publicly, you have to talk to this one, to the other one, to, you have to have contacts, and, and that helps you into publishing at the le level of your results. If you publish at, at below the level of your results, uh, they are going to punish you, and in fact, many of the, of the discussions uh, she had with this chair of the department were about that. He was saying, why don't you publish in, you see these other people publishing nature in science and you don't publish in nature of science. And she was saying, okay, I try, I, I have good results, but they don't, they don't accept my papers. So it, it must have been very disappointing, but, uh, but anyway, because she had, uh, precisely because she had been in, a Soviet, in the Soviet system, she didn't think uh, that was so important. I don't think that was so important either. So I think she was doing the right thing. She was focusing on, on the results. And then when she went to, to BioNTech, they hired her immediately because they understood what she had done is really, really important. I don't know if that answers the question. Hello, Christine here. Thank you for the talk. Um, we are trying to draw lessons from a very unconventional example. This is outside the sample, absolutely outside the, the Gaussian curve. So how can we learn anything if most of us, poor mortals, would follow this trajectory, would go to down the toilet? Because we are not genius. The lessons that we can draw is only if we are geniuses. So what is your advice to every normal person doing her PhD or his PhD or applying for grants uh, because we are mortals. Yeah, that, that's true. That's another thing I have thought while reading her memoir and, and learning about her case. This is really, this is like the, the survivor of a whole lot of, you see, you, you are just seeing the, the tip of the iceberg and the person who, who is outside, but there are many people who are going outside. But I think this, this is a good example and we can learn about, about uh, what she did. Uh, we should focus on getting good results and we should try always to be in that place where we can get those results and we shouldn't uh, let us be misled by all those 
fashions that come and go because it didn't when I was younger I, I, I have many years ago, but when, when I was younger it, it was not that important how many how many dollars do you have in funding it was more important how many good papers you have published so there will be fashions that will come and go but you know you, you must know where are you what is your goal I, I am I uh, going towards my goal that's all everyone else go get your grants get your grants be busy with bureaucracy um, have many students and many forget about science okay i'll do the science if i can so that's the lesson Okay, no more questions. I have uh, to myself. So the first one, uh, what about her daughter? Is she following any scientific, uh, do you know, if, if the daughter of uh, Catalin is in the science world or just is very good at sports, we saw that, but has got any scientific interest from her mom? No, she's not a scientist. I think she studied uh, economy. And she's not a scientist. She, she doesn't talk much about her, uh, uh, about uh, besides uh, the gold medals. But I know she loves her mother, and she's she. They are very close, and she has he, she has gone with her to all the prizes that she has received, and very proud. But she's working on something completely different, which I understand. That's another problem <laughs> we scientists have is that uh, when you see your, your children grow, you see, you see how they go somewhere else because, Away from because they, they have seen all, all your travel and you say, okay, I love you, I admire you, but I'm going somewhere else because this is not for me. Yeah, in economy, she can make also very great contributions, so it's, not, it's another field and, and the world as the society also needs uh, intelligent people working in economy. So I think she can Yeah, be maybe we great will if she gets the She will get the Nobel Prize yeah, <laughs> in economy. <laughs> yes, and my second question is about the jump uh, from the university to BioNTech uh, because she was uh, no she has uh, actually uh, very clear in her steps and very clear in her mind on the things that she uh, knew was right. So that jump on BioNTech was uh, because she knew something about the company was related with the founders. Uh, is does she writes anything about that in her memories? Yes, yeah, she explains a lot uh, about the, that st step. In her memoir, she she um, dedicates me a lot of time into that because she knows that uh, that's a big problem. Uh, many of her uh, of people of the people uh, she collaborated with went to industry before her. That's for for first. She was she was staying in science as long as she could work. So the moment that she thinks. That's it, is when she gets evicted from the lab. That's the moment she says, okay, I have, I have stayed here for many years. I have been a nobody. And now I get evicted from my lab. So that's the moment when she starts looking for companies where she can go. And she looks in many companies, but uh, she, she likes very much the meeting, and they call her. Uh, she liked very much the meeting with the BioNTech CEO because he has a focus of, on science the same way she has. In fact, this, this I, I don't remember his name because he, he's from Turkey, and, but I follow him in Twitter and he barely uh, posts anything in Twitter. <laughs> so he just focuses on science. And that's why she liked very much BioNTech's CEO. And then there is another aspect of this man, which is very remarkable, and I think it has saved many, many lives. And it is that at some point, uh, uh, BioNTech was crea created to use mRNA for cancer. That was the main goal at that point. But there is one moment when, when the CEO calls everyone else and he says, OK, we have been working on cancer all this time, which is very good for pharmaceutical industry. But I think we should be doing something for society. Let's not forget that uh, vaccines are not profitable 
for companies. They are not profitable because uh, it, it's very costly to, to produce them. It's many years normally. And then vaccines only are only useful when there is an epidemic. It's not something that, that is like a chronic disease like cancer or hi hypertension or something that you are going to be selling all the time. So he says, OK, I think we have the duty to society to dedicate part of our time to developing, de developing vaccines. And that he creates a part of his company that is dedicated to vaccines, even if it's not profitable. And that's where en Carico enters. So the right time and the right person. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so if we don't have more questions for Matilde, we thank you again for this great talk and the inspiration that you brought us. Sí.